I'm going to teach you how to bend plywood. I'm going to help you save lives with cardboard. We're going to build a taxi, all with the technique of prototyping. So I'm a lecturer at Rice University. I teach at a wonderful facility called the Oshman Engineering Design Kitchen, or the OEDK. So if I refer to it again, the OEDK is a facility where engineering design happens, and we work on real-world projects with clients that bring their ideas and problems to us. Projects like this robotic reaching aid for DFOT, which was a project we did at Shriners. This is a robotic reaching aid for D who has osteogenesis imperfecta. And this robotic aid helps him to reach things outside of the range of his wheelchair, and he controls it with a PlayStation controller. He has it now, and he uses it every day. We also have clients like the Houston Zoo, who want to extend the feeding time of the giraffes, because if there's one thing we know about giraffes, it's that they're gorgers. <laughs> All of these happen using the technique of prototyping. Prototyping is one of many techniques of solving problems. But prototyping, while solving problems, creates physical objects. Sometimes it creates objects that are intermediates to other objects, like the design of a wheelchair or uh, the product of brainstorming as post-it notes. Prototyping exists in the spectrum from ideas on the left to a manufactured object on the right. And if you have an idea that you want to be realized in the real world, along this pathway, you will maybe start by sketching some ideas, but ultimately you'll get into the prototyping process. Maybe at the end you'll hand it over to some experts to do some design for manufacturing. But I want you to know that any time that you're problem solving with the physical world, you're using prototyping, and it is a long and lengthy process. Prototyping can neatly be broken down into three different zones of low, medium, and high fidelity. And when I say fidelity, I mean cost, detail, or resolution. I don't mean commitment to a relationship. <laughs> and so to explain to you what I mean by low, medium, and high fidelity solutions, I'm going to use MacGyver. <laughs> Do we have any Angus MacGyvers in the audience? Or people that identify with Angus MacGyver that make solutions out of anything available, like this multi-tool here that he has? That's fantastic. It's okay to clap for Angus MacGyver. <laughs> Great. Angus MacGyver makes low fidelity solutions. Tony Stark, do we have any Tony Starks in the audience? Anybody who identifies with Tony Stark? Okay, so we have one person and uh, the rest of you are Angus MacGyvers. Tony Stark makes solutions that are high fidelity, that have high precision and high accuracy. And unfortunately, we don't yet have any medium fidelity heroes, but all of you who put things on Etsy, are those. All right, that's good. All right, so low, medium, and high fidelity. What I mean by that is that low, medium, low uh, fidelity to, uh, prototypes are made one-off. They're made quickly with low attention to detail, and they're just made to solve the problem, like this prototype of the giraffe theater. Medium fidelity prototypes, they are made of materials that hold their shape better, so they might require a little refinement. And this takes some specialized knowledge and some specialized tools. High fidelity prototypes might resemble a manufactured object, which means they might require uh, some, some materials that you have to refine or process first. And they definitely require some education and some specialized tools. So in the, on the right is a, is a soap dispenser that is uh, dispensed by grating it into your hand. The tools that you use that create low, medium, and high fidelity prototypes are different. So a low fidelity prototype created rapidly allows you to use things like scissors and tape and glue. Medium fidelity prototypes can be created with laser cutters and 3D printers. Again, a little bit of knowledge is required in order to make them. And high fidelity prototypes, like this lovely styrofoam over here, could only be created with knowledge of complicated CAD packages and CNC mills as well as things like injection molding or plasma cutting. At the OEDK, we have these high and medium fidelity tools. And I use these high and medium fidelity tools to teach our students how to make things. And the way in which I do that is by showing best case examples. So what you're looking at here are things that were made with a laser cutter. I told you we were going to bend plywood. That's what it looks like on the top. If you pierce plywood enough times, you can actually bend it. On the top left is a gradient that allows you to pick the right power and speed 
to cut through any material on the laser cutter. So the students see these things and they learn best techniques with these machines. So that's better than learning to operate the machines. So this is a technique mindset that we're teaching our students at Rice. So instead of learning that the laser cutter is operated by hitting the on button and then loading a file, they learn instead what you can do with the laser cutter and how you can apply it to problems. We've taken this one step further and we've created what's called the Laser Cutter Prototyping Library, and you can access this on prototypinglibrary.com, and there's 28 examples of what you can do with the laser cutter. And you can download each and every one of them. You can cut them on your own laser. You can also download a case that you can cut out. You can also download all these chat labels. And it's my hope that everybody that buys a laser cutter, this is the first thing that they're gonna make. So they know what you can make with a laser cutter. I'm gonna show you what our students are able to do with this. This is the result of my midterm in my class, Prototyping and Fabrication. These are all made with a laser cutter. I bet you've never seen plywood look so cool. When my students learn to do this, I hope from now on they see raw materials and they think possibility. They see an immobile object and they think I can make that move. I hope that when they see this material up here on top, this neatly stacked wood or this neatly stacked acrylic, they don't just see raw materials, they see possibility. I had the opportunity to go to Ethiopia this spring with a colleague to teach prototyping to faculty and students at the Agricultural University, Jimmy University. And when I arrived in Ethiopia, I found that wood raw material looked like this and that plastic raw material looked like this. And I was initially confused because there's a perceived contrast here and it's very easy when looking at it to possibly pass in judgment. But I will tell you that this is not the right perspective. The right perspective is that it's all raw materials. It all can be shaped and formed and turned into something. And in fact, I was delighted to see that Ethiopian artisans take this plastic and they turn it into these hazard signs here. So it's just raw materials. And what I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides is that everything is a raw material and it can be made into anything. All of this was seen at the Addis Ababa market, which is the largest market on the continent of Africa. On the left, you can see the expanse of it. Miles and miles. On the right is an example of a booth. This gentleman sells used paper and rocks that have been collected, sorted, and put in bins for your use. It's all raw materials, even the stuff that's already been used, which is the paper. I went to the market to pick up materials to teach the faculty and the students how to prototype. And I'm going to give you a thought experiment that I gave to these students. And I would like you to just take a second and try and listen to me and also think through this. So what you're looking at here is called a Bajaj, B-A-J-A-J. -A -A -J. It's a three-wheeled car that's surrounded by some metal. It's extraordinarily unsafe. <laughs> They're everywhere. There's no seat belts. That metal doesn't have crumple zones, it just flattens. It goes up to about 40 miles an hour. Very inexpensive. I rode in one once. Uh, they hit pedestrians a lot, and they hit pedestrians so much that, uh, well, when you get hit with the Bajaj, you have a compound femoral fracture. It's not great. Uh, this happens so much that there's actually an ER code for it, HBB, hit by Bajaj. <laughs> so the thought experiment that I'm going to pose to you is how would you design a safer Bajaj? I'm gonna show you the materials that we gave to the students and the faculty. And uh, I would like you to just take a second and think about how you would build a safer Bajaj. And in order to test it, we're gonna use a zip line because we can't actually build a car. And each passenger and driver is gonna be represented by ping pong balls. So these are the materials that I picked up at the market or brought with me that I gave to the faculty and the students to use. There's also styrofoam and foam. Cardboard. Okay, so this is one of them. 
I'm going to dissect this for you. So it's made of foam. It's held together with tape. There's cardboard that rings around there. And oh, look at this. This student and this team has taken wire and bent it like a spring as a shock absorber. Let's look at all of the ones that were made. An incredible variety of these, just from some 510 materials. What you're looking at here is the physical realization of all of these students' ideas. You're looking at what came straight out of their head. And each one is embedded with the assumptions of how a car works, how a car can be made safe, and how something will travel on a zip line or on the road. After we got all our prototypes, we needed to test them. This isn't an art show, so we put them on the zip line. Some of them were successful. They went down the zip line. None of the passengers flew out. Some of them were not successful. You'll see the ping pong balls fall out. So I went halfway around the world to teach prototyping the same way that I do here at Rice. And the students went through the exact same process just by giving them materials and a challenge. I didn't say this is how you prototype. I didn't say, well, you tape A to B. So this is in every single one of you. Everyone can use practical ingenuity and creativity to solve problems. It's in all of you. You don't have to self-identify as an engineer. You don't have to be an engineer. You just have to have a willingness to roll up your sleeves and play with some of the materials that you have. And what I want you to think of is that everything's a raw material. If there's one thing you learned from that video this morning, it's that everything is a raw material, even if it's attached to your house. <laughs> okay? Prototyping just needs an idea or a problem and some available materials. And so you might be thinking, okay, I understand that you don't want me to self, that I don't need to self-identify as an engineer in order to do this, but I also don't have raw materials. These are the things that you need. You need straws, scissors, tape, glue, foam, markers, buttons, cardboard, lots of cardboard. Cardboard is the most, is the world's most abundant resource and nobody knows it. Collect all these things. Put it in a box, and this is your prototyping library that can, you can use to solve problems. And you think, okay, well, these are really simple, and the Bajaj was just an example. But you can solve all sorts of problems with these materials. You can, uh, you can string up a tennis ball in your garage to know how far to drive in. Uh, you can uh, fix some sort of thing on your, on your car. You can even fix a gas leak here. We uh, were leaving Ethiopia, and we saw this on the gas line. It's two straws with a piece of tape. Totally unsafe. <laughs> but it solved the problem, and that's what's wonderful. And so if you want a prototype, put together your own prototyping library, cobble together with materials from your house, and here's three tips for you. Build it rough and build it fast. Don't take more than 30 minutes doing it. Don't worry about how it looks. It's going to look ugly, and it's going to have what I like to call artisan-based defects. And finally, focus on functional solutions. Thank you. <laughs>